Thank you so much, and thanks for uh, giving up some of your beach and gardening day to come out um, and see this today. What we're gonna do is about maybe up to a half an hour, not much more than that, or um, uh, here in the room, and we're just gonna look at some slides to introduce you to the subject of billboard monuments and uh, let you learn a little bit about them in general. And then we'll just go outside and take a walk in the cemetery. There's a couple of great examples out there and we'll see them in person. You'll get to meet them in person. So um, one other thing, this is actually, I think our third or fourth attempt at this particular talk. It was COVID, it was other scheduling issues. And so I'm really happy that we finally get to do it. Um, it's a great cemetery. I've done a full tour here in the past and uh, we'll look at some of the other stuff once we get out there. So we're gonna do a few slides, ask questions along the way, and then we'll head out and take a look. So billboard monuments, um, including right here. So in 2015, one of my current obsessions took root in Cumberland just down the road. As you're driving down the main road through Cumberland Center, there's a beautiful early colonial cemetery there. And I was doing research in that cemetery for my first book about our areas for a stonecutter whose name was Bartlett Adams. He arrived in 1800 and worked until 1828. His shop was in Portland. I was surveying Southern Maine cemeteries in order to find his work. And when I went to Cumberland Center Cemetery, while there, I found these, there were three of them, these long, narrow monuments up on posts. And I kind of just made notes about them and said, gee, it reminds me of a billboard sign. But I didn't do anything with it at that point. It just sort of stuck in the back of my mind because I was on other things. I was working on the Adams story at that point. Um, that top one is slate, the bottom one is in marble. So then in 2017, uh, Leslie Rounds, who is a researcher down in Saco, was writing a book about Laurel Hill Cemetery. And she knew of my work about Bartlett Adams and asked me to come down and take a walk with her through Laurel Hill Cemetery to help her identify Adams shop stones, which we did. While we were there, we found a couple of these and I talked to her about them. Um, later on, her book came out in 2018 and this photograph was in there and she actually said, the Paul family has a very unusual billboard monument, quite rare, just a few were ever made. So I, I read that and I thought, wow, is that what they are? So I got in touch with Leslie and I said, I got your book, loved it. I noticed that you have the picture of the Paul family monument in there and you called it a billboard monument. Is that what they call, what they call them? And she said, how do I know? You're the one that told me that. That's what, I just put it in because you called it that. So once her book was published and it was called The Billboard Monument, I realized that I was going to have to really call them Billboard Monuments. And so from that point on, that's what they are. So thinking about the monument style, what makes it a billboard? It's really the airspace. These are big slabs elevated off the ground on posts. Um, I've found them up to three feet above ground. So they're really on stilts. It's a nice signboard look to them but also the inscription slab, so the inscription slab is where the names and dates are. Usually they're very long and narrow, like the two pictures you saw at the beginning, but they can be up to three feet in height, so they can be quite tall and square as well, and they can be over eight feet long, so these are massive stones. The slabs themselves are usually one and a half to two inches thick, so that, and their dry weight, is about up to 500 pounds. The largest ones can be up to 500 pounds. Now dry weight is today. That's what, if we weighed that stone, it would be a dry weight of whatever it is, 500. But marble and slate are very porous. Marble especially will absorb water and it can add up to 20% weight. So we're talking about up to 600 pounds of weight being elevated off the ground for some of the larger ones. And there are lots of variations to these monuments as you'll see in the slideshow, but the whole point of the weight of them, the gravity, the gravitational pull down, creates real problems with cracks, breaks, full falls. And so some of the monu monument makers helped that by putting in um, metal connecting rods between the posts to help keep them from splaying apart due to the weight. So here's some examples on the upper right, I mean, sorry, the upper left, you can see that there's a metal connecting rod just below the billboard monument. On the one lower left, they placed it much closer to the ground. Those rods are central to the posts, 
But the one on the right here, you can see it's above the slab and it's off center. So they just put it in there to hold those two posts together. So what I discovered as I was finding these throughout Maine, because I first was only concentrating on the state of Maine, was that about a third of the ones I was finding fell into a category that I ultimately decided to call the drop slot model. You know, I figured I'm making up the name of a monument, billboard, I might as well make up the categories within them. So this is a drop slot model, and about a third of the main collection falls into this form. You, you can see here at the top of the post how they designed these posts. They cut notches into them, and you can imagine them on site putting this monument in place. They could have put the two posts in and then dropped that slab right in between them. So the post would start in position and they could drop this piece into it. Another third of them are what I call the pocket slot because it reminded me of a pocket door in a house. You can see on the right here, the post as you can see has the notch cut in it to hold that slab in place, but it doesn't go all the way to the top of the post. This would have been a much more challenging monument to install at the cemetery because they'd either have to have all three pieces together and then lift it and drop it into the ground or they'd have to dig the holes, put the posts in, splay them to put the post of the slab in and then put them back together. So the drop slot was an easier installation for sure. But there are other methods, so there's a third pocket slot, a third drop slot, other methods of holding the slabs aloft. Uh, in the lower left there, a U-shaped metal cradle that comes up out of the ground and holds the slab in place. The next one over is a metal frame. It's unique, there's no other one like this. Up on the right, there's a few that I've found that have posts with metal hooks on upper and lower holding the slab in place. And there are also some where they drilled right through the post and the slab in order to bolt it into place. So there's different ways that the monument makers put these together. I had enough material at this point and it was clearly becoming a trend in a monument style that I wanted to um, really pursue. So I wrote a paper about my research onto this monument style and I presented at the annual Association for Gravestone Studies conference in 2019, which was held in North Carolina that year. I gave the talk, these people are nerds from all over the country that love gravestones and cemeteries like me, so it's, we're in like-minded people. They kind of went nuts over this. Nobody had really ever studied this type of monument or talked about it. So they were just really all over this. So I've got people all over the country looking for this monument style. But I did get a lead for a couple in Vermont. And so I thought, okay, they're not just Maine. They're gonna go beyond that. Following that, I had enough material to put my first book together about the monuments. So I did that, Billboard Monuments of Maine. But the release was May of 2020 perfect timing for COVID when nobody was doing anything and all of my book talks had to be canceled or postponed, um, but that's okay. Um, so here's the map of the main monuments. The orange boxes are where all the billboards are found that are covered in the first volume. There are 38 at that point that I knew about. You can see that it covers about a 175 mile path from the uh, New Hampshire border up to the north, Dover Foxcroft and Bucksport. Haven't found any further east or north than what you see here, but once that book was published, some of my readers and other gravestone enthusiasts did find four more. It's the four yellow boxes um, outside the range that we had already discovered. So there are 42 in Maine, and that's no more have been found since then. Um, those four plus others are what led to the second volume of the series. So I did go to Vermont and started poking around to see if I could find billboard monuments, and in fact, they were there, um, and very similar to the main ones. So their posts are here. You can see the slabs are long marble slabs inscribed, and notice also that they installed the metal rod on some of the posts to hold them together. So clearly very similar to what we have in Maine. Something new in Vermont, though, the posts were made largely of marble instead of granite. In Maine, they're granite. In marble, where they actually harvest marble, they use the local material. So there's a lot of these bright white posts on the marble billboards in Vermont. And then came the first one in New Hampshire. Now, those of you that live in New England know that Maine doesn't allow billboard signs on highways. 
neither does Vermont, so both of those, our states, don't have billboards. New Hampshire, though, allows them, and I love this picture of the billboard monument because this honking, huge, real billboard on the upper right, it shows you what a billboard highway sign is. This is a really cool, small billboard, uh, the first one that we found in New Hampshire, and it's a memorial to four of five wives of this man, David um, Howard, and just the names of his wives are here. He had five wives. The fifth one didn't make it onto the monument for unknown reasons. She predeceased him. She should have been listed, but she doesn't make it onto the monument. The other thing about this is, I don't know if you can see the chains. It's, this is a chained family lot, so in fact it made like a nice border around the plots. The other difference here, this is soapstone. It's not marble as we see in Vermont and Maine. Primarily the Maine collection is marble with a few slates, Vermont's marble. So this one was the first one in soapstone, a new material um, for the collection. So Maine also has a Four Wives billboard. It happens to be one town south in Cumberland. Um, and you can see that this monument style really allowed a family to memorialize decades of their family history. So Reuben Sawyer is here, his first wife Betsy, second wife Olive, Susan and Jane in the order of their marriages and their deaths. He outlived them all. Each time he remarried, he found a woman younger than his previous wife, didn't do any good. Um, they all ended up dying. And then uh, two children of his are on the last panel. So if you go to the Cumberland Center burying ground, you're going to find all three uh, of those monuments. So not just wives. Sometimes it was kids who lost their lives. This is a very sad case down in York. Um, diphtheria took down five of the six children in the family, so it was a very sad month for this family. You can see that they memorialized their five children all on one monument. It's a beautiful white piece of marble with two breaks in it, and unfortunately, the person who tried to fix that did not know what they were doing and used like a black tar type substance to put the pieces together. It's the wrong thing to do. I'll show you a little bit here how we know how to conserve markers and use the proper materials to do that so that the cracks are invisible. It's not quite like what we're seeing here. Um, as I explored Vermont, I found a unique design only found in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, Thirteen have this unique design and eight of them with a capstone on it, and that is the carver cut a ledge into the post to support all the weight of the stone and you can see how it's cut in there. That turns out to be a, an ingenious design because it really protects that monument from falling, cracking, and having other issues that we see everywhere else. The Vermont Northeast Kingdom collection is in much better shape than all the other ones found in, the, in, in all three states because they're supported. It's, it's like a painting on an easel. It's got support below. It's not just bolted, although they put a bolt here to help hold it in place as well. This is the way one of the Vermont notched posts with the capstone looks head on, so you can get a chance to see what that looks like. So one of the other things that we think about, or I think about when I look at this monument style is the posts. So in this case, we have purely utilitarian posts. They were not intended by the monument maker to do anything more than hold that stone aloft because you can see here they're different sizes. This is a much wider one, a much smaller one on the other side, so they add nothing to the design. We'll take a look at the back. You can see the, one on, the smaller one is broken or cut. It's just a piece of found stone that they use to hold that up. This one, much thicker than this one, as you can see, but it's rough cut. It, again, it does nothing to add anything to the, to the monument itself. But in contrast, there are some where the posts are integral to the design. On the left, we have these two posts which have the stretched pyramid top to them, which give it a really nice look. Um, on the right, we have the finial on this one. This is just showing you the one side of it. Um, but it's just a really nice, almost like a fence post design, but it gives it a really good look. And then this one is one of my favorites in Corinth Cemetery in Vermont. Uh, it's here's the one with the stretched pyramids, right, in the same cemetery. But this one is really cool because it's got the marble spheres on the top of the post. It gives it a wonderful look. It's a great, great cemetery. If you're in Vermont, this is my 
probably my favorite cemetery in the state, Corinth Center, and it's just got beautiful long views of the hills as you can see. There's a meeting house similar to this one on the property. So this is a true churchyard, as is this churchyard rather than cemetery. And you know, you can see that they put this beautiful uh, monument up in place. This also is the only one that has uh, in the whole collection in New England that has the connecting posts on both top and bottom. So then New Hampshire. Um, I found this, this particular one on Find a Grave website. I was just scrolling through searching for monuments. I found it. There's the picture from Find a Grave. And I thought, oh good, it's a, it's a billboard because it's got the airspace and it's elevated. But when I showed up to meet it in person, I was surprised to see that someone had cleaned it. And it really reveals the beautiful veined marble post. So in fact, looking at the picture on the left, you wouldn't think that the monument maker was thinking about the look of the monument. But clearly here, we've got these striped veins in the post that give it a really beautiful look. So there are five cradled billboards in Maine. You can see here um, one of them. It's a big, big slab, as you can see, with four panels of inscription. And these metal cradles that just come up out of the ground and hold it in place. Now, the first three that I found were just like this. I didn't know what was below ground, so I didn't know if it was just a pole or if it was something more than that. But this next two, because there are five in all, uh, that your ground has eroded away, and in fact, there's a large slab, con uh, not concrete, sorry, granite slab that these are fit into that hold those stones up. In some cases, they buried that below ground. In other cases, they left it above ground. Uh, only one in Vermont has those cradles. It's this one here. You can see the metal cradle here holding the monument, but none of them except this one has the clawed feet on a granite post. It's a really unique design. It's a little hard to see the detail, but this is a fabulous marker. The lettering on this is like 60s pop art. It's just really cool. And the, cut, the stone cutter put boxes with little words in here, Holy Bible, Book Divine, and different messages to the reader. Um, just a great, great um, stone. And it became then the cover of my second book. It's just, it was too good not to have be the cover. So uh, that's the volume two book. Okay, the largest one in the land, there's 73. The largest one is in Vermont on the Canadian border in the town of Morgan. It's over eight feet wide. Again, it's about 500 pounds dry weight. This was a surprise snow squall when we were visiting. Um, so I've got the white background instead of green, but anyway, that's the largest. And here's the map of the 73. It just shows you in Vermont, they cluster to the east of the Green Mountains, except for the one in St. Albans, but they seem to be this side. Uh, so 27 of 73 there. There's only four found in New Hampshire, and they're really not clustered at all. There's one north, south, east, and west, as you can see. And you saw the main map already. Now, in my first book, I put this one in. I called a chapter one in a million because it was just so unusual. It is posted. There's a metal rod between them to hold them together, and it is an elevated piece of marble, but it's a spinner. It's an eight-sided marble. Each panel is inscribed with names and dates. The person visiting this monument would be able to go and spin that wheel to see who they wanted to see on each piece. Truly, I've never seen anything like it. So it's called One in a Million in the book because it's just really, really cool to see. Um, and so I found one for Vermont as well. So my second volume, One in a Million, remind anybody of a toilet seat? Yeah, it sure does. As you're coming up towards it, it looks like a raised toilet seat. Now from the side, it almost looks like a tabletop, a tilt tabletop, but head on with the white, it's like toilet seat. Now this guy, Myron Wilson, was actually a printer. And this is the frame of a printing press that he used. In his will, he said, when I die, I want you to use my printing press as the frame for the family stone. So in fact, this is the front of the printing press frame, and you can see the inscriptions, and it's decorated. That's the reverse side, also inscribed with more family, but there's no decoration on the frame. Just a really cool, cool stone. Okay, so waiting for us just steps away are the two here in Yarmouth. Um, we'll see them shortly when we go outside. Uh, the first one by the gate, here's a picture I took of it in 2019. You can see that it really needed to be cleaned. You can also see this dangerous crack 
in between panels two and three. Someone along the line had put this post underneath to help hold that up. Um, this monument was described in family documents in 1950s by a descendant of the Hill family. She said it was an odd-shaped headstone in her notes, and indeed it, it is. We today are gonna call it a billboard, but she called it an odd-shaped headstone, and it had been erected about 100 years before she came and visited it. So that's the 2019 picture. In 2020, I came to visit it. This is what I found. That crack had you know, created the fall, and the panel just was on the ground. Somebody had propped it up. This was the prime pandemic time, so nobody was getting together, but I formed what I called the rescue team to try and figure out how to save this thing and get it back on its feet. So I organized a rescue team um, that included a friend of mine on the left, Tamara Condi, who's a, a stone conservator out of Salem, Massachusetts. I talked to her about it. She said, I wanna come up and work on it, see if I can fix it. Um, Linda Grant locally from the Village Improvement Society, Steve Johnson from the town's public works, Katie, of course, um, wherever she is, oh, way in the back, um, from the historical study, Craig Stinson, who is a direct descendant of the family, who's written well about them, um, offered to help fund the repair, and then, of course, myself. So none of us ever got together in a room. We never met to talk this through, but we got the thing done. Tamara came up three times over the course of the year uh, and worked on her own, and this is what it looks like. Now, that crack, which was right here, you can see, is, you can barely see but the white infill that she used. As this lightens, because she cleaned the stone, as this lightens and gets a little bit closer to its true color, which is this bright white, that's just gonna pretty much disappear. So we'll see the detail of how she did that when we go outside and look at it, but you can see it's a beautiful, beautiful job that she did to bring it back to life. One other thing, note the orientation. Notice all the stones are in a row, all these headstones are in the same row. Notice this one is going the wrong way, in effect. It's, it's parallel to the grave itself and not to the line of stones. This brings us back to my early research in trying to figure out what's this monument style all about. Now, this is an engraving from the mid-1800s of a churchyard in London. I've got six or seven similar documents to this, but notice here, this is what we call a grave rail or grave board, which is an English monument. They ran parallel to the grave, not at the headstone like we do headstones today. Here are the headstones here. I believe that this is the um, design that was brought over to the New World and led to us finding these billboard monuments in New England. So here's a before and after, just obviously a very different. It's cleaned, repaired, it's looking beautiful once again. And he was the guy that built this one, or not built it, the guy that paid to have it erected, was truly the last man standing in his family. He had seen um, his eight siblings passed before him, his parents, his wife, four of his children. So he was the last one and had this erected to memorialize them. And it reads, erected by J.C. Hill, Esquire, 1859. So it's great that it's got a date on it. We now know exactly when that monument was made. And the ma ma monument makers actually signed the stone on the bottom. It was the team of Hunt and Jewett. It was a man and his son-in-law. Uh, here's an ad, mid-century, mid-1800s, in the Portland paper for their work. What I think is cool about their ad is they're showing the gravestone, but notice that it's tilting. You'd think that they were advertising their work, they'd have an upright, clean, but for some reason they did a tilting one. Anyway, Hunt, Jewett, and Company on Congress Street. The year that they did this monument, 1859, they actually won a bronze medal at the Maine Charitable Mechanic Association Exposition for their marble work. So it says Hunt and Jew awarded to Hunt and Jewett for marble work at the exhibition of 1859. So they are the guys that did the monument. So the largest in Maine and likely the inspiration for that monument um, is a stone that memorializes James Hill's daughter, Mary Sargent. She's on the left there. She was the wife of Cyrus Sargent, who's memorialized right here in the center, and then two of their kids. So we'll see that also momentarily. Uh, what you'll see on this is, here's the um, compass and square, the mason symbol on Cyrus Sargent's panel. 
there's an urn and an urn there, and here's the detail. Notice it says erected 1853. So that one went up first, the hill one went up six years later. Okay, a few final facts and then we'll go. Um, these monuments were made only from the 1830s to the 1880s, so it really was limited to a couple of generations of stone cutters. They are primarily marble, but there are a few in slate, one soapstone, one limestone. 51% of them are what I say co-located, co meaning that you can find one in a cemetery where there's another one already there. So they may be related as these two, this is mother, father, and then some kids on the two there, but they're not always related, as in Cumberland. It's three separate looks, but three separate billboards over there. And 53% um, of them are in peril. This one, as you can see, is completely fallen from its posts. But these are, again, big, big, heavy monuments subject to you know, weathering and you know, 150 years of um, abuse and neglect and whatever. So they're really in some trouble. And uh, more than half have cracks, breaks, falls, etc. So Yarmouth is well represented in both books, volume one, billboard, there's a whole chapter on the Sargent one, and there's a whole chapter on the Hill one, but it's not just about them. There's other stories in there. A captain lost at sea in an 1842 storm, a brave woman who in the 1860s sought a divorce from an abusive relationship, a Bridgeton mob on the wrong side of the slavery issue, and a soldier who died on his way home after his wife had died here in Maine. And then in volume two, there's a whole chapter on the fall and rise of the Hill billboard, but also a man who sold a son his freedom, the issue of marriage between cousins, a woman who died of summer complaint, men who were described as not handsome, and another one as short, thick-set, and dumpy. This guy was a legislator, and they did a bio on him and said he's not a handsome man, um, which was a little bit odd and then a mine worker's horrific death. So uh, it's not just about the gravestones, there's a lot of other stories in there. Let's all go to the cemetery. So do you have questions about any of this before we go? Yeah. I have a question. You have to put marks about the material itself. I realize that's probably another whole lecture. But you, you, what are the, uh, the durability of the different stones, the easy workability? Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, happy to talk about that. So um, slate was the first gravestone material that we used in colonial times. So from the middle 1600s when they first started to mark graves until about 1840, slate was the material of choice. It's that dark gray, it's relatively easy to carve, it lasts forever, and it was plentiful and inexpensive. They started to import marble, the beautiful white marble, from Europe around the late 1700s, early 1800s, but it was very expensive. And um, so it wasn't until early 1800s that they started to quarry the Connecticut River Valley uh, marbles and bring them into our area. But when they did, man, it took over. So the marble really took over cemeteries from the early 1800s through the end of the 1800s. Marble is a much softer stone, easier to carve. They could do intricate designs. The stone cutters loved them because it was easy to carve, easier than slate. And people loved them because they were beautiful and they could do three-dimensional designs. But what neither people nor the stone cutters realized was they wouldn't last. It's so soft, it erodes away and weathers away. So when we go out in the cemetery, you can see a slate stone and a marble stone side by side. The slate looks like it was made last week. You can still read it really well. The marble's all eroded away, but the marble could be 60, 70 years newer, and it's just because it does not last. So slate to marble is really what we experience in our area, and then to granite. So when machine cutting was uh, started in the late 1800s, that replaced marble as well. And granite, which is very, very hard material and requires machines to cut it, is what we see even today. Lasts forever, you know, and so we, our evolution in our area is slate, marble, and granite. One other little story about slate to marble. So slate was plentiful and it was the material of choice. When we're doing conservation in a cemetery and we need to dig up a stone to do work on it, what we find is that the slate, mar slate marker is about two thirds above ground and one third below. That was for stability. So they would bury a third of that marker below ground. They didn't mind doing it because it was plentiful. When they brought the marble in from Europe, they didn't want to bury a third of that below ground. 
So they created these cradles, which would go below ground to hold that above. You'd only lose about a two inch amount of that stone. So when we're doing conservation and we dig up a slate, you have to go way down. When you're digging up a marble, it's only gonna be a couple inches because you'll find a cradle underneath that holds that stone aloft. So nowadays it's all granite, you know, and I think times have really changed um, to take away from that. Sandstone we see, soapstone once in a while, schist, but it really slate, marble, granite. Are they equal in structural strengths since they have to do the across the span? No, granite is clearly the most, um, is the strongest of all. Slate is second and marble least. And then sandstone is just, you know, goes right away. Um, yeah, all different, yeah. Yes. yes. Regarding the uh, one of a million yep. spinning, yes. is that still spinnable? No, somebody has put a metal brace on the top of it to prevent it from spinning. And I don't know why exactly they did that, but yeah, there's a metal piece that's been fit in more recent years to prevent it from moving. So if you want to read the bottom, what you normally would spin, you have to kind of get down and look and see who's there. So they've fixed it. And I imagine it was because people were just, you know, screwing around with it. And I can imagine kids just, you know, spinning. Yeah, doing their thing. Yeah. 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 When it comes to the billboard monuments, yep. do you have a sense of why people are doing them? Is it an artistic thing? Yeah. Is not wanting to bury material? Yeah, I, I don't think it's the burying the material. I mean, I've thought a lot about that, and there's, there's no answer for sure on what they did this for, but, you know, most of, when you go out into a cemetery mid-century, so again, this is 1800s time period, it's really vertical. Obelisks, tall monuments, that's really the look that you see. This gave a whole new dimension, these big long slabs that went this way. So it was a whole new look. I, I wonder if it was to keep monuments above the snow line. You know, when you, in the wintertime, are going by a cemetery, a lot of that stuff is just, you don't see it. Something up on a signpost, you could see it still. That might have had something to do with it, but it's just a, a guess. You know, it might have just been the... People saw that design and liked it and said, I want to do one of those as well. Yeah, yep. But it, it looks like it might have been more expensive. It yeah, actually wasn't that expensive. I've got a couple of records for what it costs to do these things, and it wasn't that much different from um, a regular monument. Most of the stone cutters would charge by letter, so you would pay for the material, and then if you had a big epitaph or lots of lettering, they would charge extra for each letter. But um, I think these granite posts that they used in Maine were so plentiful and inexpensive that it didn't add cost. It was really just the slab itself. And whether you laid it on the ground as a tomb cover or had it standing straight up into a thing or had it you know, on a, on a billboard or on top of a box tomb, it's still what you're paying for is that slab. So it wasn't that much different, yeah, in cost. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Did the technique, does, does it exist outside of the so here's the thing, um, it does, but not very much. Um, there's three, so we, we, I've got these New England ones documented, 73 of them. There's three in Western Massachusetts. We haven't found any in Eastern Mass. There's three in Western Mass, and there's two in Ohio, Northeast Ohio. And I think, and they're exactly like the main collection, the time frame, the material, the look. So I think what happened is one of our guys went out, relocated to the Midwest and brought that design with him. So we've only found 73, which are covered in the two books. And for my volume three, if I can find more, I'll do the Massachusetts, the Ohio, and whatever else we can find. So we're still looking. And even after the con attending the conference, nothing in the South? Or, uh, no, no. And People are looking. They're all, I get emails from people all the time. Still, I went to another cemetery in Arkansas looking, can't find any. So, you know, we'll find a few more, I would imagine, over time, because it's easy to overlook them. But, um, you know, so far, still looking. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so one of the little centers, is that from one of the four corners where there's a gas station the rest? Yeah, it's right, right in the very center of town, Route 9, I think it is, and there's a church, and yeah. I, I don't know if that's what it's called, but there's his fire station, historical society, and all that stuff is right there in that corner. Yeah, so there's actually three in that cemetery. So it's not just one, there's three. So there's two marbles and a slate in that one cemetery. Yeah, definitely worth seeing. Yep. Go ahead and talk. So this is the Hill billboard, the Hill family billboard. So James Coffin Hill, J.C. Hill up here. Um, again, it's dated. 
and he died about five years after this monument was made. He and his wife are up by the other one, which we'll see in a few minutes. So this one is just about six feet long. It weighs about 400 pounds. You can notice that there's notches. Uh, the way the stone was cut, if you look closely, you can see these little tabs fit right into the notch post. So they really fit this nicely into the post. Um, the Hunt and Jewett signature uh, is just above the line right here. You can just barely see it says Hunt and Jewett. Unfortunately, the Portland, Maine piece is now not revealed because when Tamara did the repair, she had to use this metal piece below to you know, support the weight of the stone. So she installed that to hold it up. So behind this mortar that she used is the words Portland, but you do see the Hunt and Jewett. You should also take a look at the back. You can see the repair line here is the white mortar. So we can match the color of the repair exactly to the stone. We now can have that capability instead of that black stuff like the other one used. Um, again, he was uh, uh, the survivor. 15 other members of his direct family had predeceased him. So he is the one that put this monument up. The first side says brothers and sisters. And there are seven of his eight siblings listed in order. They are all in the chronological order of their deaths. The last name, which is here, is his wife Mary's younger brother. The last name is Stockin or Stocking. And um, so he's there. But there was one other sister of his who died before him and could have been on here, but wasn't listed. And she died in 1856. And I think it was less about maybe bad blood between them. It was more about the fact that she was married with kids and he probably left her husband to end up memorializing um, her um, to his own liking. Um, so on the right, so it's his name and the date erected, brothers and sisters, which are here and here, and then his parents. So Sarah and James Sr. are listed here, his parents. And the interesting thing about this, again, the orientation is perpendicular to the graves, not as a headstone. Um, his mother has a slate marker right here, which was never pulled. They left that in place for whatever reason. So uh, she's memorialized twice, here on her own slate marker and then here on the marble. So now that this is cleaned, you really get a sense of what these originally looked like before they get covered with lichen and messed up. And also, um, if you're interested in just knowing it's really rough like sandpaper because it's just eroded away. It's not polished like it would have been originally, but over time the weathering takes away that, that polish and it makes it really rough like sandpaper. sandpaper. How old was he when he died? He was, um, we're going to see it's on his marker up ahead. Good question. I don't remember, but he's got a grave and we're going to look at and will tell us. So, um, Anyway, that's the Hill billboard. Again, mother here, other members of the family. There is Hill family members All here. Well, represented here are buried here. Well, we, we think, think that they're probably here because this is the only headstone left for Sarah. This is where there's a broken stone here. This is a row of graves. These go behind, the bodies are behind these. So all of these Hill family are somewhere from here up to the stone. Yep. And again, for whatever reason, they left her marker standing. Um, this piece here might be the father. I mean, I don't know for sure. It's hard to know. Unless we could find an old photograph that listed who they were. Yep. So before we start walking down the hill, just take a look at the back of the marker for a couple of things. One, you can see the metal channel better. You can see the brake line and how Tamara repaired it. And also just feel this and just feel how rough it is. So most of the markers that are here as you're walking, these dark, dark ones are slates. Here's a granite obelisk. It's much smoother and will last forever. And then here's marble. So you've got three different, the three different prime types of material here. Um, there's one other thing that's very different about this cemetery than most cemeteries of its period is that there are no footstones surviving. The town or somebody has pulled them all up. Now, when people bought grave markers in the 17 and 1800s, they got two markers. They got a headstone and a footstone. The headstone is here, the body is here, and a footstone would have marked the back of the grave and would have been inscribed on this side so you could look from either row at who's buried there without stepping on the grave, and it would have just had initials and maybe a date. In 
modern times, many towns have decided to just pull the footstones up and discard them so that they can mow. And it's unfortunate because that's the history of the place and it's the history of the family stones. And it's just, it's just one of the cemeteries where they decided to do that. But if you go to other colonial cemeteries, you'll often see the rows of footstones that are on the opposite side. People think they're all kids because there's little stones. No, they may be, but mostly they're footstones that go with the headstones. Yep. So looking to the right, you really get the vertical sense. All these monuments are just kind of tall and narrow, and that was really the look in most um, mid 1800s cemeteries. So this is the other billboard in Yarmouth that's a great, great stone. The scallop top instead of, you know, just a flat top is really cool. And again, the sun couldn't be doing any better here, the way it's shining on this marker. I cleaned this one, I don't know, two or three years ago. It was pretty dark and encrusted with stuff like these are, and it's looking pretty good now. Um, so this is Cyrus Sargent. Here's the two urns erected. Um, 1853. Now Mary Sargent was again James Hill's daughter who we just saw he put that monument up and she was also the wife of Mr. Sargent. She died at their home in Arkansas 1852 at age 26 and the small letters it says remains removed 1853. He had her remains brought back to Yarmouth for burial. We think probably packed in spirits which is what they often would do to preserve the body for the trip in the mid 1800s. So she's here. He outlived her by many years. As you can see, 1886, died at age 65. Um, so he's in the center panel with the Mason symbols of compass and square. And then two of their daughters, Lucy and Alice. So Lucy was very young, eight months old. Alice died in New Orleans. Now, Cyrus Sargent was a very well-known, successful businessman, resident of Yarmouth, but he also had a huge uh, business interest down south in Arkansas. So he would make many trips with his family down the coast, through the port of New Orleans and up the river to get to Arkansas. And it was in New Orleans that daughter Alice died in 1850 at age five years. You can see it says children of them. And then Alice's remains removed 1850. So he also had her remains brought back. Sargent himself was quite an interesting soul. He um, spoke out during uh, the Civil War uh, about having some sympathy for the Southern cause. He had his business interests there, so he was you know, making money and that's where he was doing business. And when he talked about the Southern cause and his sympathies for it, some of the folks in town got really teed off about that and suspected him of being a spy for the South. He was actually clobbered on a train ride to Boston. They took him down, they attacked him and grabbed him and put him in jail. He was in prison for about three months, accused of being a spy um, and for the South. And, and so people, once the dust settled and they sort of realized who they were talking about, they realized he, he really wasn't that. And they rallied to support his release. And in fact, the U.S. Attorney General intervened on the case and did release him from prison. But he was in jail for, um, I think, two to three months. Um, so, go ahead. Um, when you say packed in spirits, yeah, what does that mean? Well, that means that there was they had not perfected embalming until the Civil War period and after, so they would put bodies in, case them in liquor and alcohol really? to preserve them. Yeah, to ship them. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> like pine pitch, and I've seen other materials that they used. Um, bodies that were later exhumed, they would open and they would find straw and all kinds of liquid, you know, that they use. Yeah. And what material do you use to clean these? Okay. So cleaning markers is a, is a um, challenging business. If you ever, first of all, there are laws all over the state now and everywhere about who can do the work and who can't. You need permission from the right people and the family and the town and the whole thing to do any work on historical monuments. But the best way to do it, if you're gonna clean one of your own family markers, is you use a soft bristle brush, it, rub it on your arm. If it hurts your arm, it's gonna hurt the stone. So if it's rougher than that, don't use it. So never metal brushes, just bristle brushes that are like plastic bris bristle brushes. And plain water, 
The best way to clean is to soak it, soak it, soak it. I just keep spraying it and spraying it and get it really soaked and then brush it with the brush and keep rinsing it off. And that really, you'll be amazed at how much that can take down the lichen and get rid of the stuff. Um, but if you're gonna use any kind of a uh, material beyond water, the only thing you should use is called D2, the letter D and the number two. And it is a biologic solution that is used by the federal government for cleaning monuments in the National Historic um, the Park Service. So D2 is it, and it's you just spray it on, brush it, keep it, rinse it, rinse it really well, and, and it works over time so you don't get instant um, satisfaction. What you do is you get rid of all the dark stuff, but over time it lightens as this one w has lightened. It works on everything, but granite is so solid it doesn't absorb the lichen. This, these porous ones absorb the lichen and they get dark. Granite, which is where? Oh, right here. Notice there's hardly any lichen growing on that. That's, and it's not dark. It's because it's so resistant to growth. If you have a granite marker, all you need is water and a brush. You don't need any chemical at all. Come right off. Yep. But for the slates and marbles, you sometimes need the chemical, which is D2. Never bleach, never soap, never flour, never any of that stuff that people bring in. So just be very careful about that. Okay, so that's the second one. Now to the far right is, we're gonna answer your question about how James, how old he was when he died. 72. 72. This is James Hill, his wife, Mary. This is their shared marker. So he's the one that erected that. And again, it's their daughter who's on this one. What's really nice about this marker is the symbolism on it. So we have intertwined the oak leaves and the ivy. Very often for men, oak leaves, symbol of strength. For women, symbol of enduring pay, uh, devotion and everlasting love is the ivy, often on women. The other thing that's really cool is when you're strolling around a cemetery and you see oak leaves, look closely. Notice the acorn is missing here, so oftentimes the missing acorn or broken flower bud, things like that suggest the shortening of the life, the life cut short. A missing acorn is classic. Now tomorrow, I mentioned to some of you, I'm doing tours at Greenwood Cemetery in Biddeford. There's a father and son whose markers both are decorated with a very simple oak leaf at the top. The father lived to age 70 something. His acorn shells are empty. The son died at age 29. His acorns are all intact. So it's a very subtle difference that you wouldn't know unless you sort of study this stuff to see that the younger man still has the acorns in place. The older man, the acorns are gone. So um, it says, joined above, parted below, meaning not below ground, but earth and heaven. Yep. And so again, it's James and Mary are here. Uh, their son Alexander is just to our left, to their, yeah, to the left. And let me tell you his story. I think I wrote down, I wanted to tell you, yeah, okay. So this is a little bit of a sad one. Alexander Hill, son of James and Mary, he was down in um, Arkansas at their home at the time. Uh, on his way home down the river, he died at age 35 in 1847. And so he was living in their Arkansas home and he was aboard the steamer, the Edna. About halfway to New Orleans, as the steamer was leaving the wharf at Columbia, Louisiana, all four boilers exploded, killing 20 to 25 people and wounding six or eight others. 26 people were saved. So reports on the news noted that there was an unusual whizzing sound coming from the boat as it approached the wharf. And while they were there for 45 minutes, no water was thrown on the boilers to cool them down. The conduct of the crew was subject of conversation among those aboard. They said that they were operating under, quote, a state of excitement and, quote, under the influence of ardent spirits. So the crew was not paying attention to what was going on in the boiler room. When the explosion occurred, the boilers and boat itself were shattered into countless pieces and thrown up to 400 yards away. And in the paper, it said, quote, the groans of the wounded and shrieks of the drowning exceeded description. So it was a very sad scene. His body was recovered and he was brought home for burial here. On his um, on the memorial here, there's three linked chains. He was a member of the Odd Fellows. Often we see FLT, Friendship, Love and Truth, which was their um, 
symbol, but it's a beautiful obelisk in his honor. And then we have Augustus and Olive, who are other children of James and Mary, who, as you can see, died young and they share a stone. Their stone is signed by Smith and Cheney in Portland. And that one is signed by, good thing I wrote it down because you can't read it anymore, um, Cleves and Smith out of Saco. So we're fortunate to have signatures on these markers. It's kind of rare to find them, but we've got Hunt and Jewett, the Cleves brothers there, and then Smith and Cheney. The reason for the signatures is because up until around 1840, there were only a few carvers in the state of Maine, but by mid-century, tons of them had come in. With, the, with marble being the primary material and everybody wanted to get into the business of carving, they had to then differentiate from each other. So they signed their markers. And you can find advertisements in the papers saying, if you want to see the quality of my work, go to Evergreen Cemetery and you'll see. They signed it so that people could go to the cemetery and find the signature and see what kind of quality they had. And then these are sergeant family members too. So this whole line is all related to the sergeants. So there you have it. Questions about any of this? Yes. The other, the other do not do is color washing. Right. Like there's some cemeteries up in coast on the island and you look and it, everything is all bright white and you yeah. pull somebody in and power wash yep. everything. And that just like takes the... Yeah, that's exactly right. right. So power washing is out too. It's really gentle hand washing is the way to, to do it. And um, you'll see you can do great things with just water, soft bristle brush, and a little bit of elbow grease. Yep, but you're right. Power washing is a no-no as well. There's really good resources if you're ever needing to clean a family stone. Go to the AGS, the Association for Gravestone Studies website, or here in Maine, MOCA, M-O-C-A, which is Maine Old Cemetery Association. They've got a whole video and tutorial and info about how to clean a gravestone. So it's just easy to find sources if you want. Yep. Yes. I see what I think is maybe a mirror image crack on those the two yes. outer panels yep. at the bottom. Yes. How do you, are they, were they originally one piece? This, um, no, it's not one piece. This is in fact though, and I meant to say it, so I'm glad you brought it up. This is in fact, you know, from a distance, it looks like it's in great shape. It's not, it's threatened because there are these stress fractures here, 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 and there's one here. Now, over time, the water especially is going to get in here in the fall and winter and freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, and sort of break it apart. And it, this one could very well fall. One of these could just actually go up like the hill one did and fall. And the way to work on that would be if we did some infill uh, just to fill it, not overfill it, just enough to sort of fill that crack and, and try and keep water from getting in there. So this is one that's on the threatened list by virtue of the fact that those stress fractures on the bottom are there. Yeah. So no, but it does kind of look like it's a mirror image, image but, but it's, it's not. not. Yeah. The only permanent solution though would be like a bar across the bottom. Like she, she did, did on that it. one. And you know, the, the, she's a historic preservationist. And so the challenge is how do you bring a monument back to life as best you can without, you know, interrupting the history of it. And, and she had to do that on that one by installing that metal um, piece on the bottom. It was the only way to support that break, to be sure. So she did it, but, you know, it's not the way it used to look. So you have to sometimes make those decisions. decisions. Yeah. Ron, do you know anything about this one down here that's raised up? It looks like on... And they kind of concreted concrete. it all in? Yeah. I've never been able to understand. You'll see it as you walk out. It's a big family, like a double family lot. And the stones are in there, but it looks like they filled the whole thing with concrete. It's like they never want anybody to ever get in there again. And who wants to? Now, a. And yeah, so it's, a, it's an odd thing. Yeah, but they, it looks like they just con filled it right with concrete. Yeah. I don't really know more about it. Yeah. yeah. This goes beyond your field, I guess, you know, that you know the answer. And that is, people were buried in a box. Right? Yeah. And the box, they were, didn't have vaults. Like Correct. Some cemeteries require today. So, mm -hmm. First of all, you have that subsidence, then yep. you have the box deteriorate. Yep. How come things are more or less even? Because you know, over time like they've been filled in. So in colonial burial practices, people were only buried as deep as they needed to be buried to get in the ground. So when you're excavating a grave, which we don't do, but when you are, 
burials in the colonial times maybe three feet below, four feet below, um, and that's what they did. And bodies were either just in a wooden tight wooden box, you know, the six-sided wooden coffin, or wrapped in a cloth shroud or canvas and buried that way. So the body and the shroud and the box all deteriorate over time and relatively quickly and create the sinkholes that you find in some cemeteries. But over time they get filled in. So now it's level ground for the most part. And it wasn't until more modern times that they actually did the concrete vault piece of it. Yeah. So most of these graves are all subject to, they would have probably had sinkholes in them over time because the body in the box deteriorates over time. Yeah. Yeah. That's for mold. Yeah, for mowing. Yeah, the towns would just keep when, things level when so they I was can a mow. kid, there were a lot more yep. sinkholes yep. here. Yeah, and just over time they yeah. get filled in. The towns have filled them in. Yeah, yeah, okay. just to keep so it eat easier to mow. and safer to walk. You know, safer for people to walk too. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. So you talked about um, the removal of the footstones and the convenience to create the convenience for mowing. Yep. In, in colonial times or through the 1800s, how were cemeteries maintained? Did the grass get long? Grass got long. Sometimes they were the true. So there's different kinds of cemeteries. This was a churchyard because it was associated with a meeting house. So it was a true churchyard or graveyard. The public burying grounds not associated with um, a church or meeting house our burying grounds or burial grounds. We didn't use the word cemetery till the mid 1800s. So burying grounds and churchyards. In the burying grounds were common areas. Um, people were generally welcome to just go dig a hole and put a body in. That's, it was public ground and that's what it was, a public burying space. Um, and so they would often graze their animals in that space as well. So sheep, cows, whatever they had could go grazing and keep it down, down that, that way. way. Yep. Or they would have used like a scythe or a sickle, you know, to pick the huh? yeah. What else? Okay. Oh, Thank you. no, we're not done. No, no, no. Go ahead. Is um, Olive E on the left here, is that his second wife? Yeah, wife, wife of, of Sergeant. He, I think, had three wives. I think that's the second. It might be the third, but I think it's the second, second one. Yep, but she's a wife. Yep. I think he had three in all. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. So again, if you're interested in books, I have some and the History Center has them as well. And I'm going to just go pop my trunk and you can come see me if you'd like. Thanks for coming. It, I mean, it's our history. We all have descent. We all have ancestors who are in these cemeteries. And it's important that we all sort of do the best we can to take care of the landscape and the monuments and document them as best we can, realizing that sometimes weathering takes them away from us, photograph them, document them. It's really about um, preserving history and that's what we're doing. Okay, there's great places to start. One of them is the Maine Old Cemetery Association. There are all kinds of historical societies that have friends groups which do cemetery related tours and information. Um, and it's really, it's as easy as just getting on the computer and. Googling a few things to try and find a community, uh, you know, in your community, a group or a historic cemetery, reaching out and starting the conversation. Uh, there's some other great early cemeteries in the area. This is a really good one because it's the Meeting House Cemetery. Um, but yeah, there are other ones still in the town and you can go on to the Find a Grave website, put in Yarmouth and it'll give you the list of all of them and show you where they are. So I have books out on Bartlett Adams, who was our areas for a stone cutter. Portland's Historic Eastern Cemetery, and I have two books, uh, volume one and two, about this unique billboard monument style that we talked about today. And um, I'm brewing an idea for my next one. So as soon as I get one out, I start thinking about the next one. So they're all available um, through me directly or in local bookstores, or of course on Amazon has all of them as well. So uh, yeah, you can just Google Ron Romano books and you'll find different links depending on you know where it sends you.